My guest today is Latimer Alder. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much. And uh, welcome, everybody, to, to the podcast today, which I've called Net Zero for Dummies. Um, just a few words of introduction about me. I'm uh, an independent commentator on, on climate and energy and, and COVID and a few other things. Um, I'm not affiliated to any organization. I've never been much of a joiner of anything. Uh, part of that is if I'm an organization, always want me to tell me what to do, and I'm not very good at being told what to do, and I'm certainly not very good at doing it. So I'm independent. And the, the approach I take to all this stuff is I go where the data takes me. Not being a member of any organization, there's nobody pressurizing me to do this or paying me to do this or whatever. I just, I'm interested in data and I go um, to make my conclusions from, from what that is. Now, this is the third time Tom has been kind enough to invite me on to his uh, podcasts. And on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the two I've done before. The first one was called Climate Data for Dummies, and pretty obviously what it was about. We looked at some data about climate. The second one was energy data for dummies, and that's clearly about how we, how we get our energy. And net zero is really the place where climate and energy kind of intersect right, as to, to what people think they're doing about climate and energy and net zero and, and all those sorts of things. If you want to know more about me, please go and look at the first 10 minutes of Climate Data for Dummies. I'll give a longer introduction in there. Um, and also, just please do look at Climate Data for Dummies, Energy Data for Dummies. We'll go over a little bit of the same ground in this presentation, but not too much because otherwise it will last forever. Net Zero is a huge topic, and to get it down to a manageable podcast, we've had to you know, rush through a little bit of stuff. Now, you might be asked, wondering, if you've not seen either of these before, why I'm calling them for dummies. And it's simple. You've probably seen in the bookshops, there used to be the great uh, books about personal computing were called I don't know, Windows 10 for dummies, and now they're called uh, other things for dummies as well. well the, the, this podcast is kind of a tribute to that. What they try to do is to take fairly complicated technical subjects and make those accessible to ordinary people like you and me and the guy you meet down the pub and the lady in the shop and the nurse and anybody else that you can think of who is not a specialist in these topics. I, I tried to do that with climate data and energy data and people tell me I, I came close to getting it to get it right. So I'm reasonably happy with that. And that's the name of it. It's not because I think you're dummies. I think that we, we're trying to explain it in a way that's accessible. Right. What are we going to talk about today then? This is sort of the agenda for net zero for dummies. And the first thing we'll look at in some detail is the sort of science behind this net zero stuff. And we'll see how strong that science is and, and how much uh, weight we should give it. Well, after that, we'll look at a case study of a country that is actually trying to do net zero, and that's the United Kingdom, which is where I'm based in, far out of London in the Thames Valley. Uh, we'll look at that, again, in a little bit of detail, not because I want, I think everybody needs to know the exact details of the UK, but because it shows up some pointers about what may be going on in the rest of the world. We'll look then at how the rest of the world is approaching net zero. And finally, we'll look at some conclusions and maybe even a bit of speculating about the future. So let's go ahead. And the first question I'm sure everybody is dying to know is, what is net zero? And I've tried to define it here. And if you see what, I, what I've written, net zero is an idea. It's not a program of work. It's not a scientific observation it's a it's basically a fear and it, it's a fear that the earth and everybody everything on it that includes us humanity is in so much peril from climate change real you know existential peril that uh, the only thing we can possibly do about it to save ourselves from death or species extinction or whatever, is to eliminate all our fossil fuels. 
this is what net zero says. It effectively means eliminate all fossil fuels. The idea also says it is so big a threat that we have to do this very quickly, more quickly perhaps even than the technology will allow us to do. We've got to do it completely. And it doesn't matter how much it costs. It is such a grave emergency threat that it doesn't matter if societies collapse or countries go bankrupt or whatever. We just have to do it. Well, those are big claims. <laughs> and uh, as always, if you've got big claims, we need to see some big evidence to go with it. So let's go and examine the science behind it and see how, how much weight we can put on those. Let's start. If you saw my climate data video beforehand, you will have seen this guy before. This is Richard Feynman, the great physicist, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize and a great science communicator. And somebody once asked Richard, what is science, Richard? And he tried to summarize it like this. And he just says, if it disagrees with the experiment, it is wrong. What he says is, when you're doing science, you're making guesses about how you think Mother Nature works. And then you need to go and test your guess against what Mother Nature does. No good having a great guess. If, if Mother Nature does not adhere to your guess, your guess is wrong. And you have to do that by a process of experiment and by observation. And the way he kind of says it. Is better than me. It says, it doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't matter how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. And that's the guiding principle behind all science, or all true science. So, with that as our watchword, let's go and look at the claims of the need for net zero um, against experiment. And wonderfully, we've done the experiment. We've been doing the experiment about climate change for the last 40 or 50 or 60 years. Way back when, when people first started to be concerned, let's say in the 60s and 70s, it might well have been legitimate for them to say, well, we don't know what's going to happen. So we'll be very cautious and very frightened of this thing because it might be nasty. And that's fine, and I can sort of understand that. However, we've now done 60 or 70 years of climate change, and we can see that in the graph down here, which plots the temperature of the Earth, the global temperature of the Earth, for the last 60 years. And we've taken that from something called the Hadcrut database, the Hadcrut data set. Hadcrut is one of the big global data sets. It's uh, kept in the UK by the UK Med Office and, and university guys. And they all say roughly the same thing, that roughly in that 60 years, we've had about one degree centigrade of global warming. It's about one twenty thousandth of a degree per day. And so we are able, with some confidence, to say we know what global warming does because we've done it. And so we've got the test, Feynman's test of we can look at an experiment, we've done it, and see how things pan out. So the sorts of things that climate catastrophists and net zeroists would like you to believe is that we've got a catastrophe and the world is coming to an end. Well, let's look at what the data that we can collect over the last 60 years actually says. And here, I think the, probably the most important chart is we have a greener world. Everybody says they want they want green, they're greens, they want a greener world. Well, here we are. This is a chart produced by NASA. NASA have satellites whizzing around the world all the time. And they are looking at exactly that question. How green is the world? And you can do that with a sort of light meter and filters and so forth. And over the period here, which is 1982 to 2016, so over 30 years, they have seen that the, the leaf area, the amount of greenery in the world, has increased. And you can look here and you can see nearly everywhere it's increased. It's not saying that all these areas that are colored in green are overwhelmed with forests. It's just saying they are greener than they were, even if there's only a tiny little bit of green in the Australian desert here, for example. 
yeah, there is now a bigger, tiny little bit of green. And the reason behind the tiny little bit of green get, the, getting bigger is two things. One, the world is warmer, but well, we saw that in the previous slide. And warmer, as you probably know, if you're a gardener, plants grow better in the warmth. That's why we have greenhouses and all sorts of things like that. And just now, in, even in the garden, my garden in the back garden here in Thames Valley, things are starting to grow much better as the general temperature increases. But the second thing is that we're using something called carbon dioxide, the carbon emissions that we want us to cut to stop them having. Well, carbon emissions are also ways of feeding plants. Plants grow using carbon emissions. That is their food. So with a combination of more food for the plant and warmer, we get a greener world. This is not surprising science, but it is the effect we've got, a warmer and greener world after 60 years of global. Now, I can't persuade myself either of these two things are a catastrophe or are something that we need to do anything about. If it may be somebody else claiming to be green actually wants to, wants to stop the world in its tracks, but, but I'm not one. Now, one of the other, one of the common themes people say is we must, we must stop global warming because otherwise we will starve. The world will come to an end. Nobody will be able to grow anything for all sorts of reasons, of floods and fires, blah, 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 blah. Well, let's see again, we've got 60 years worth of data now about crops and how they're growing in the world. And this is a chart from the United Nations. So I think we can give you know, some credit to it. And let's look at it, what it shows. It shows, first of all, the little green line here shows in 60 years, the yield from our cereals has gone up. That means for every plant we plant, how much effective crop do we get from it? And if the, the yield's gone up to 200%, we get twice as much, twice as much crop as we used to. We've planted a little more land. You can see it, just a little bit more land. Land used for cereal has gone up a little. So the production has gone up more than twice. It's more than twice cereal production than the crop yield because more, more of it and more, more of it and more per area gives you total greater more. And the population of the earth is also shown here. That's the line here at the, at the bottom. And you can see that the yield and the production have both gone up faster than the population. And what that says is we all overall have more to eat than we've had before. We've got more people, but the, the people are not growing as fast as the cereal production is. So we got more, more to eat per person than ever before. And we've got more people than ever before. So that's a win and a win. More people, each of them having more to eat. Doesn't say, yes, Tom, you asked me. Oh, could I throw in one thing? Just that cereal uh, yield being up by 200%, it's actually a factor of three, right? That was uh, one is now three, yeah, right? Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's it. My handsome assistant has corrected me, but but in the in the nice way yeah. that I'm wrong by underestimate. I'm always too generous to to those who wish to buy buy. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for pointing that out. You're absolutely right. It is trebled in production. Two hundred percent is trebled, not not double. Um. So we were saying, yes, you, you've got we have more to eat, and everybody has more. To eat. Does not mean to say that nobody in the world goes hungry does not mean to say that there aren't pockets of famine and, and so forth. But if they are, the reason is not climate change is reducing the amount of food in the world. You can see the amount of food in the world is going up, which is not going up. Lots of reasons why people might go hungry and, and distribution of food is one of them. But that's well outside the topic of this debate and, and as I say, for different reasons. What else can we look at? Oh, people keep worrying that they're all going to die in hurricanes or wildfires or drown or something or another. Ooh, well, there's a great database kept in Belgium called the World Disaster Database, the International Disaster Database. And people have been counting. Forgive me. I need to go back one. 
People have been counting the number of people who've died from what you might call climate disasters over the last 100 years. And you can see it on the top here. It says floods, droughts, wildfires, hurricanes, and extreme weather. And these bars represent the average number dying each year by decade. So it's a little bit difficult to understand, but what it says is in the 1920s, on average in that period, about 480,000 people died of some form of climate disaster. In the 1960s, it was down to about 180,000 per year on average in the 1960s. And you can see it comes down to 2010 and 2020, and we're down to about 20,000 people who die per year of each of the, of, of the total of all those things which people call climate disaster. Now, first thing to know is, of course, that, that trend is going rapidly down. It's going rapidly down because we, as humanity, are getting very much better at dealing with climate disasters. We, we, we have better houses. We have better warning systems. We have uh, more boats in flooded areas, and, 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 and. And that's a, an observation about humanity adapting to changing climate and adapting to things. We're very good at adapting to things. And those who think, you know, want, want us to take drastic action to stop it, uh, rather than do adapting, are, are missing out on the, the, the fact that we're, we're good at If you do the sums, you come out with a rate, you can work out how many people, you know, what your chances of dying in a climate disaster in a, in a year are. And there are eight thousand million people on earth and 20,000 die in a year of climate disasters and if you do the sums that gives a rate of dying in climate disasters of one in 400,000 and that's all that's your rate if you're worried about dying in a climate disaster your chances as an average human being is one in 400,000 put that in perspective it's about one in 5,000 to die on the roads. So if you're worried about climate disasters killing you, you should be terrified of moving outside your front door in case you get run out or getting in a bus or driving your car to, to the local supermarket because they are much, much, much more dangerous. And 400,000 people for Brits, <clears throat> to find the one person you need the one person who's going to die, the one in 400,000, you would need to fill out our national football stadium, Wembley, about five times over to find just the one person. So it's a very small number. And as you can see, it's a decreasing one. This is not a catastrophe. None of the things I've shown you are a catastrophe. But if you watch the energy data podcast, you remember that the, the slide that said there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And indeed, that's a fundamental principle of thermodynamics and it's a fundamental principle of lots of things. And here we can see that there is a small price that we have to pay for all the good things you've seen before. And the small price is the sea level around the world is rising. Once again, our friends in NASA have been measuring sea level. What they can do with, with satellites is they can measure absolute sea level, not by standing on somewhere that a piece of land that itself may be going up or down and thereby complicating the subject. They reckon they can measure absolute changes in sea level very precisely. What they've seen over 25, 30 years is that the rate of sea level is a, a rise is about 3.4 millimetres a year. If you translate that out, it comes out to a foot in a hundred years, thinking in imperial terms. So sea level is rising at the rate of one foot in a hundred years. The reasons behind the sea level rise are twofold, really. As I'm sure you've heard, there are some ice caps and glaciers and social that are slowly melting. And as they melt, their, their fresh water, their melted water, goes into the sea and raises the sea level. And that's a small part of the 3.4 millimetres. It's probably about half. The rest is that, like many things, when you heat up water, 
We've seen the globe is already warming. The water expands a tiny little bit, and that's the majority of the thing you see here in the tree. But remember, this is one foot in a century. Now, seriously, folks, if you cannot handle one foot of sea level rise in a century, I'll do you a deal. Send me a Twitter, and I'll lend you my Wellingtons. They won't even, it'll hardly get, in 100 years, it'll hardly get over my Wellingtons. So that is the general size of this catastrophe. So there we are. We've done, the, we've done Feynman's experiment. We've looked at the results of climate change over the last 60 years. And have we seen a catastrophe as, as many people would like to think or mistakenly think is there? No, we haven't. And here's the, here's the summary. In the 60 years, we've got a warmer world. We've got a greener world. We've got a better fed world. We've got a safer world. And the price is that sea level is rising at one foot per century. None of this says to me we have to do anything at all. None of this says catastrophe. But, okay, let's move on to the next because a lot of people think we do really need to do something about this stuff. And they then get their ideas that, oh, yeah, but there may be nothing actually happening now, but just around the next corner is the bogeyman or is the catastrophe. And so and a lot of that is based on computer models. And it's quite surprising how much the world has become gripped by model fever over the last 10 or 15 years. And that people's Critical faculties seem to just glaze over when somebody says, I've got a computer model. The immediate assumption among so many people is that, oh, gee, that must be right then. It, there can be no argument. It's a computer model. This is, of course, bunkum. There is no reason to think just because you've got a computer model, it's any righter than a, a model you could pre prepare by yourself. Uh, and it still contains that, that same difficulty that Feynman says here. The test of all knowledge is experiment, as, as Richard Feynman says. So if we have a model, we need to test it against experiment, just like anything else. And it's arguable that because you could write for any particular problem, you could write, say, 100 models. And if you had written 100 models, only one of them is going to be right at maximum. Really, I think we ought to say it should be down to the modeler to prove that their model is right rather than for anybody else to try and <clears throat> say that the model is wrong. The burden of proof should be with the modeler, not the assumption by everybody else that you know, it, it's fantastic until, until we can prove otherwise. Over here on the left, I put a, the, a, the classic remark from Yogi Berra, the American baseball coach. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And that is absolutely right. Over here, I've shown you something about models from COVID days. I don't know if in other countries, the name Neil Ferguson means very much, but Neil Ferguson was the modeler in the UK who, whose models were seized upon by our government to uh, produce all the COVID stuff of lockdowns and masks and social distancing and whatever it was. Um, and somehow nobody ever challenged his models, even though his track record was appallingly bad. And here's a chart I made after six months of COVID showing that when we look back at Ferguson's models, foot and mouth, bird flu, swine flu, he was you know, a hundred to a hundred thousand times wrong in his prediction. And yet, for some reason, gripped by this hypnosis that we had a model, the government seized upon everything he said and, and, and treated it as, as godlike stuff. We should not do the same with models about climate. We should force the models to, to be proved to be right before we even begin to look. And sometimes you get really weird things where you look at a paper and it says, well, I took a model of climate and on top of that, I put a model of economics and beyond the one of economics i then took one of crop yields and i put them all together and i proved that 
if nobody had burnt, I don't know, a ton of coal, the rainfall in Nigeria would be 1% less or whatever. And they claim that this is some sort of attribution science. This is just crazy. We really should be much, much harder on, on models and, and their proof. And on the right hand side, I put what happens if you start believing bad models? And this is a picture from 90, I think it's 1979. So just as I was leaving university, this is a picture from Mount Erebus in New Zealand. And you will see that there are bits of an aeroplane here. Oh, sorry, Mount Erebus in, this, in Antarctica. There's a bit of an aeroplane that had flown from New Zealand to look at, just as a sightseeing tour, Mount Erebus and Antarctica from above. Big, long journey. Unfortunately, the model they were using, effectively their guidance system, had been programmed badly. And it all went horribly wrong because the guys who were flying the aeroplane we're faced with a choice. Do you believe what they see with their own eyes or do you believe the guidance, the model, the guidance system? And they chose to believe the guidance system. Unfortunately, the guidance system had it in the wrong place. And so instead of flying into nice clean air, they flew into the side of Mount Erebus and 250 people were killed. Using a bad model, because you, and because you believe it right, is a very, very dangerous thing to do. And we need to be careful that we're not overwhelmed by believing bad models. Well, says people, even if we haven't got models and even if we haven't got data, you must do something about uh, net zero because a lot of us climate scientists think you should. We have a consensus and consensus is about as big of a bunker as some of the models are. Consensus is a political term. Consensus says we're going to count the heads of the people who say they believe in it. There's a the classic climate science thing is, you know, 97% of climate science believe in something or other. Well, so what? It doesn't matter what they believe in. The whole point of science, as we saw from Richard Feynman, is to take the human element out of your researchers. It's the experiment that counts, not what people think. And this is a lovely quote from Michael Crichton, the American writer, who wrote a lot of good semi-thrillers based on technology-type uh, subjects. And he says, Con consensus is invoked only in situations where the science is not solid enough. Yeah, exactly. It's a very weak idea. But having got no evidence of catastrophe, having got models and consensuses only, we see that the case for the net zero idea is very weak. And we should be cautious about making big changes because of that. Now, let's move on and think, even if we could decide that we knew how to control the climate, and even if we could control the climate, as the, we, you see the picture here from, this is Spinal Tap from Nigel Tufnell, pointing proudly to his amplifier, looking at, could he just twiddle this knob and set off the climate, the ideal climate that he wants everybody to have? Wouldn't that be a lovely idea? Well, the idea is that carbon dioxide, the emissions, as mentioned earlier, are indeed the control knob for climate. And all we have to do is set the right control knob and the right climate that we want will, will appear. Fantastic. Let's do it. So, but if we go back through history, you see, does this work? You've got a chart here going back 600 million years. You can see that the estimates of how much carbon dioxide here is the black line. And estimates of the temperature is the blue line. And do they go up and down in sync? Does it look like carbon dioxide determines the blue line? Well, no, it doesn't really. Sometimes they go up and down together. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're, they're in opposite way. There's no great correlation even that says CO2 is the control knob for climate. It may well be. And, you know, greenhouse gas theory and all that says it is part of the things that control climate. But it is certainly not the thing that controls. And therefore, you can't 
<clears throat> just dial up your right level of CO2 and thereby expect your climate to be whatever it is you want. And then the big question comes, let's assume you could, let's assume that this was possible. The question then arises, where do you want to set the knob? What level of carbon dioxide and so what level of climate is the one you want to strive for? answer to that question nobody has it's a philosophical question of course nobody has ever come up with an answer is it the level it was before humans started burning carbon or is it a level a hundred parts per million up from today where we're nearer the garden of eden the paradise that we all started out within the old or is it somewhere in between and, and then how do we determine what would be the best climate? And then you can say, well, what's the be best climate for whom or where or what? Big question. And nobody's ever even begun to answer that question. At the moment, the idea seems to be, well, whatever it is, we must stop it. And that's like my, my mum when I was a, a child. And it, was, it was lunchtime. Lunch was on the table. She'd always say, see, Latimer? Go and find your dad. Tell him what. Tell him to stop what he's doing, whatever it is. And that seems to be like the climate change. Right. Spent quite a lot of time looking at those things, but let's summarise. Then this is what we think of the science. So we, there is no evidence for any climate catastrophe or emergency or crisis. There is no evidence of any existential threat for it. There is no scientific need for net zero there's nothing there that says you know this because of this bit of data we must do net zero and therefore i conclude it is purely political theater net zero is a political idea it's not a scientific fantastic let's look at what's a place where we are trying to do net zero and that is the united kingdom and here as you might expect in the center of the world <laughs> is the United Kingdom. It's a little red blob here, in case you're not too familiar with what we are. It's the little red blob on this island and the northern bit of the red blob on that island. That's Ireland. This is Great Britain. And the United Kingdom, our country, is the merger of all the red bits there. Overall, in terms of carbon emissions and therefore amount of climate change that induced we are about one percent of the world and you'll see that a bit later. and our politicians with no false modesty think we are leading the world to net zero that the world is in awe and following our lead well i think politicians are rather deluded in that environment but let's see from the political point of view, it's worth looking at how did we get to this idea of net zero. And it's a little bit of a um, hmm, little bit underhand to my mind. Way back when in 2008, the then government passed a Act of Parliament, a Climate Change Act. And that, that means a law. In, in British terms, an Act of Parliament is a law that said, we will make a <clears throat> reduce our carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. And that might just about have been possible by 2050. But it did two other things as well. So one other thing as well that was important. And it took away almost any decisions about climate from Parliament uh, lawmaking body, and it set up something called the Climate Change Committee, which was, well, still is a committee of the great and the good and eminent people. You know the usual, the usual suspects who are given the task of defining the climate budget for the country for the next few years, and the government is obliged to act upon it. They, we no longer have parliamentary scrutiny of climate stuff it's given to this committee and i read some of the debate they did they did actually have a parliamentary debate and a parliamentary vote um, so we might think it was inadequate but it, at least it happened and i read 
a lovely speech by one of the MPs who said, wasn't it wonderful that, uh, you know, c that parliament and democracy could no longer interfere in, uh, in climate things. It was divorced. Such a big problem is divorced from our democratic system. It wasn't that great. And he was you know, overexcited about this. And then I discovered that three years later, he became the chairman of the new climate change committee. Well, what a big surprise. Those of you who know anything about British politics will remember this guy. He was John Selwyn Gummer, <clears throat> the guy with the beef burger from the beef burger scan, who changed his name when he got promoted to Lord Deben and served for 11 years as chairman of the climate change. So that was one thing. And we were ticking over and we were sort of doing some emissions reductions. We'll look at a chart of it later on. In 2018, so five years ago now, six years ago now, it was this 80% emissions, which might have been doable, was amended to 100%. And 100% says absolutely have to stop all emissions of anything. That means stop all fossil fuels for, for, for in it. And this was done not by parliamentary debate, not by act of parliament, but purely by the relevant minister signing a piece of paper that said, oh, we'll change 80% to 100%. So big change to net zero, done at the stroke of a pen. There was no parliamentary debate. There was no vote taken. It's true to say there was a discussion about it. The discussion in Parliament lasted 88 minutes. Of our 650 MPs, 25 spoke. 22 were overwhelmed with excitement that now we were leading the world. Three of them had mild reservations and nobody else bothered to turn up for what is effectively the biggest change in our lives probably since the Second World War. And then in 2019, there was a general election uh, the, prime, the then Prime Minister is a guy called Boris Johnson, who you probably may have heard of, the guy with a flyaway hair. Um, and we'd had a big political debate over the previous five years about a thing called Brexit, about us leaving the European Union. Johnson's manifesto basically was, get Brexit done, do carry out the wishes of the people. And somewhere in that manifesto, it said, in, in small print, it said, oh, and by the way, we're going full steam ahead for net zero. And so anybody who voted for get Brexit done also discovered that even though they probably didn't know they'd done it, they'd voted for uh, doing net zero in, in the country. And that all leaves a bit of a nasty taste in the mouth because we've never had a popular debate on this subject, even though it is so far reaching. And there's no real democratic mandate for net zero in the UK. It's all been done by the great and the good and the parliamentary committees and so forth. Um, and I suspect that's the same in many other countries. Yeah, I, I, I talk on Twitter a lot to people in Canada and, and I think certainly they're getting um, around that, that idea. Uh, in Australia, it seems to be popular. I'll quite work my way around. But we'll see, well, we wonder if that continues. Now, Let's look at how these emission things were going. We passed the Climate Change Act here, 2008. And that was when we said we wanted to reduce our emissions from 600, 550 million tonnes to about 110. So that would get us down here. And we're ticking over quite nicely. In 2018, we said we're going to do net zero. And that says we have to bring these all down to nothing. In that period between 2008 and 2018, there was progress made in reducing emissions. And there's one basic thing that, that the government were able to do, excuse me, and that was to close down coal-fired coal -fired power stations to make our electricity and replace them with gas-fired power stations. Now, simple bit of chemistry says to get the same amount of electricity out of coal and gas, you get fewer carbon emissions from the gas. So simply by changing coal to gas, you reduced your emissions. And that's fine. And you can carry on doing that until you run out of coal power. 
And when you've got none left to change, then you, your emissions reduction comes up. And there's some fairly, I think, disgraceful pictures of energy secretaries supposedly there to maintain the energy security in the UK, gleefully blowing up power stations because they'll never be needed anymore and aren't we wonderful in saving the world. Um, only for us to find last year, for example, that while the last one was due to be decommissioned, the government went cap in hand to the operator, said, please keep it open another year so that we can get through the winter without the lights going out. It wasn't a very clever thing to do. And you can see in Germany, they had uh, very similar sorts of things. When they closed down their nuclear power stations, ideological reasons, they had to restart some coal powered stations and I think there's a wonderful thing where they actually knocked down a wind farm to get at the coal underneath it so they could burn it. And that, you, climate policy brings up some really weird things that people do. Account. So that's coal and gas. That's, that's done now. There are no more coal power stations that we can decommission. Uh, so we're stuck with where we are. And to get to the rest of that chart, to bring that all down to zero, we have to get to zero. Let's look at where all the energy currently goes. And you can see from here, this is a fig these are figures from 2022. Electricity renewable is about 6%. It may have gone up by now. It might be renewable e electricity. So that's wind, wind and solar and hydro and so forth. Might be up to 7 or 8% now. Electricity non-renewable will be over decreased a little bit. And this is the segment for electricity. It's about 20% of the UK's total energy goes into making electricity. Probably the same in other countries. I think the world average is 16. But, but so, yeah, if you want to think 15 to 20 is, is typical for most countries. But everything else, the rest, four-fifths four fifths of the total energy of the country, comes from fossil fuels, comes from oil, and comes from gas. And to hit net zero, these have to disappear. These numbers, oil must go to 0%, gas must go to 0%. Coal must go to 0%. A little, tiny little bit of coal. Bit. And we've got 24, 26 years, 25 and a half years to do that. Hmm. That's a bit of a challenge. Big challenge because... Those are still big numbers of, of energy. And this is where it gets really interesting because if you now look at where are those, uh, where is that energy used, you come to a very surprising and unpleasant condition, uh, conclusion if you're the government. And it comes to things. Energy supply, 25%. We've done most of that. That's not going to go down very much more. You probably don't want to harm businesses and industry. An awful lot of it has already offshored itself. I mean, in the days of recession and post-COVID, you probably want to keep those going quite nicely. So you left with two segments you can attack. Transport. That's mostly people's private cars, people's well, buses, lorries, and so forth, but mostly private cars. Hmm, that means you're attacking pe people's private cars to get them down to, you know, so that'll be, you know, everybody must have an electric vehicle type thing. And the one that I think is the most exciting is residential. What does that mean? In the UK, the norm for heating our homes is gas, gas central heating. Not everybody has gas central heating, but they are, it is by far the biggest segment. And we've had it for, we've had gas central heating for 40 years. It's installed, it works, and everybody's happy with it. It's never been a political issue. Problem with burning gas is it gives off carbon emissions. So they have, the idea is you must have to somehow get people, everybody in the country effectively, off gas central heating onto something else. The something else they talk about is heat pumps. And heat pumps are an electrically powered way of heating your house that, from all accounts I can read, are not as good as gas central heating. So the idea is that you will now, as a government, have to force your own people to spend their own money, and it's a lot of money, 
on changing their heating system to meet the target that the government have set themselves. Ooh, I'm sure the people are going to like that very much. And in transport, it says your private car has to be replaced by an electric vehicle. And maybe there are some good thing, reasons for electric vehicles. But they're stonkingly expensive compared with the petrol vehicles that we all have today. And the government says, well, what we're going to do is ban new sales of petrol vehicles. But if they do that, that will, they will never get to their 2050 target. It's far, it's far too near to be able to effectively wipe out the vehicles you've got already. And then the bills are going to start coming in. Effectively, you're electrifying everything. So you want the, the electric vehicle for transport. You want to, these heat pumps for domestic. To do that, you need to add in a much bigger electricity grid. And that has to be paid for by somebody. There's, the only people who can pay for it are, are the users. Even if they, even if it goes via taxes, and just looking at these sorts of numbers, for every household, we're looking at something between seventy and a hundred thousand pounds to to hit this net zero target. And arguably, there are no benefits to the people, none whatsoever. You are not better off by having a heat pump rather than gas and heating. You are not better off by spending forty thousand pounds on a electric vehicle, and in fact, you've got a vastly expanded electricity grid, will be entirely invisible to you. There's no, no, it makes no sense. So people being asked to pay £70,000 a household for nothing, as they would perceive it. Now, you might know that in the UK, we are very fond of our National Health Service, and we pay quite a lot of money for that. Um, it's a bit of a... Uh, that's the word I'm looking for, a national icon. But all this lot put together adds up to 10 to 20 years worth of budget for the National Health Service. So you're basically saying, here you are, here's your choice, Mr. Taxpayer. You can either pay for 10 years of the NHS or you can spend all your money on stuff you don't want to hit an arbitrary net zero target. And I think that's just not going to fly as people start to see these big bills coming home to them. Now, let's look at some other stuff. This is, I really don't expect you to look at this chart, but, but in detail. But the, the government had one set of advisors, and they call themselves the FIRES Project, not because I can't remember what it called, stands for, not because it, they're setting things on fire, but because that was how the acronym worked out. And they got, these guys actually looked in detail at how you could get to 2050 and net zero. Though they, they were made it absolute zero. Then it is, it, the only way to do it is to say there are no carbon emissions. And a couple of interesting things come out here. If you read the chart, some fairly frightening things. You know, you'll drive 60% less, but your car will be a ton lighter, which is very strange because battery powered cars are notoriously much heavier than, than petrol powered cars. You'll eat less meat. You won't go, um, we won't make so much stuff. All your a lot appliances at home will be clever and they can be shut off the government's whim. But the two ones I find most interesting along here. <clears throat> the big no entry sign says no more flying. They kindly suggest we will be allowed to keep the airports in the three national capitals, London, Scotland, and Northern Ireland together, so that the politicians can fly between the three. But they're going to stop all the old regional airports. I mean, in England, we have Gatwick and Manchester and Glasgow and, 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 uh, and effectively stop people going on holiday. So not only can you have to spend your 70,000 quid on the net zero appliances and cars and stuff you don't want. You can't even go on holiday to enjoy whatever money you've got left. Don't think that's going to go down. And they say stop shipping. Well, that's an interesting one, but it, it has to be, has to happen. Ships run on diesel or, or similar things to diesel. And there's no prospect that anybody's going to be able to make a suitably sized 
battery powered electric ship for car for cargo. That basically says UK has only one way of doing imports, and that's through the Channel Tunnel, which you can do in a train, and the train can be done as a uh, 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 is electrified. So that's fine, assuming you got the electricity. The Channel Tunnel is a very narrow pinch point, and all the ports we have in the UK, Southampton, Liverpool, Tilbury, Grangemouth up in Scotland, and, 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 we'll all have to shut as well. And what we'll do for imports and exports, I have no idea. But to meet the net zero target, that has to happen. And, 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 and so it goes on. The more you look at this in detail, the more you realize that from a political point of view, this is going to be a disaster as people. Now, some of you may have seen the work of Josh the cartoonist before. He, he pops up on some of the climate skeptic website. I don't know, very happily had a cup of coffee with Josh not long ago in the Houses of Parliament. And he's great at coming up with things. And this is his take taken from the old um, nuclear disarmament movie about snowmen, I think it was. I can't remember exactly. But here we are. What does net zero mean for you in the UK? It means you're not going to have any heating because you can't afford a heat pump and you can't replace your gas boiler. Be a, well, you pay so much money in tax you won't have any. You can't afford an electric vehicle because it's too expensive. You not only can't afford to fly, you're not allowed to fly. Uh, and the costs and so forth will be so much more that there'll be no jobs. And like they say, zero chance. Here, here is our poor, poor little chap, the average man in the street, that's you and me, with no chance from that to And that's where we are. That's where we're going towards. There's no proper democratic amendment. There are no benefits to it. It's just costs and inconveniences. And when I wrote this chart, I said, how long can this last from a political perspective? And just almost, you know, almost they must have read my mind because the big three political parties in the UK still say they are committed to net zero and all that stuff. Though in fact, they're rapidly running away from it, but they're keep keeping the fiction that it's on. There is a smaller party called the Reform Party, which is coming up in the polls. So it's a, it was a small party. It's now polling at 15 to 20%, which is not enough to, to make a big influence in British politics, but it's enough to be noticed. And they're starting to say, well, actually, we'll have a proper referendum about this, or we'll just drop net zero entirely. And I think that will be something that eventually the other parties will have to uh, have to follow. There will be an enormous hoo-ha because there's an awful lot of people in the UK making a lot of money and a lot of careers out of net zero. But I think in the end, the sheer lack of political will to do it will, will triumph. So that's the UK. How does net zero go down in the world? Well, the world's a big place. And let's try and just spend a couple of minutes on this. The world does net zero and does all this stuff by climate conferences. You probably have heard of all these. They're sometimes called COPs, C-O-P, Conferences of the Parties. And the idea is that you go to a conference of the party and your country makes some global commitment to say, we will cut emissions by this or well, that much or that much. And this country over here will do it by 2050, and that one will do it by 2060. And at the end, they all pat each other on the back, sing old Lang Syne, go home, and do absolutely nothing at all about it. And here, some people have carefully plotted for us the rate, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, and they plotted against the number of climate conferences we've had in the Grand Declaration. And you can see, first one was in Rio in about 1990, the most recent. Bar one, in fact, was in Glasgow, or two was in Glasgow in 2020, triumph of the world, Mr. Boris Johnson strutting his stuff. We've saved the world at tech. But none of them have had the slightest influence on emissions. <clears throat> the world's carbon dioxide emissions are continuing to rise, and whatever the diplomats say, you know, they go home from the conferences and do nothing. The reason is people like carbon emissions because they like what it gives them. They like energy and they like power and they like the 
controllability and all those things that fossil fuels are notorious. Why does that happen? Well, we can, we can sum this all up. Why, where the quotes problem or where the things in this chart, this shows broken down by continent. And you can see North America and Europe and have been slowly decreasing their emissions over time. Not very much, but they, they could say we've decreased a bit. Africa, South America, Oceania, small places, about the same or maybe be increased. But the big, the big winner in the emissions race is Asia. Asia continue to put out carbon. And we, we are foolish if we don't understand how big Asia is. More than half the people of the world live in Asia. About 53% of the most part. That is pretty clear if you talk to people who live there. They don't give a flying fig about emissions. They don't give a flying fig about climate change. They would like to be rich and prosperous like they see the people of North America and Europe were. And they can work out because they're clever and industrious people that the reason we get rich and prosperous here is we use a lot of energy. They will say, well, let's get more energy for us and we'll use it and we too can become rich and prosperous. And, you know, let, let the strange Westerners worry about these emission things because we ain't going. And only today, China announced they were going to be opening more coal mines so they could get more coal to burn, to make more power, to put in the air, to make more emissions. And until that changes, and we see absolutely no reason at all going back 20 years, that Asia is ever going to do anything different. And India is <clears throat> coming up fast on China, and between them, they're three-eighths of the world just about. Then that's going to stay the same all the time. So that's, that's the Achilles heel. And I thought I'd just put this one in. Um, H.L. Mencken was a philosopher, Canadian philosopher, I believe, from a um, political commentator from about 1910. And he had, if you read his stuff, he has some wonderful aphorisms. And here he says, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to, to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, so nasty, mystical things, all of them imaginary. And you might, if you were very, very cynical, you might think that applied to COVID, but you don't have to be very, very cynical to work out that applies to net zero. It is really just a hobgoblin to frighten the people. So, getting to the end now. Net zero is purely political. There is no great scientific reason for it. It is unachievable in any realistic time scale. You can see what you know, the UK has no hope of getting to net zero by 2050. It's got no benefits to ordinary people like you or me. And therefore, my prognosis is it is doomed to fail. My corollary from that really is that fighting climate change is really a waste of time and effort. We don't know what we're fighting. We don't know if it, we don't even know if the method we're trying to use to fight it is going to work, um, and we're just wasting our time and effort. What we should be doing, to my mind, is use these resources to adapt to any climate change. Not, not start to do big major programs for saying oh, 50 years out, 100 years out, but if the sea level in your local area starts rising, build a seawall, get some boulders, stick it in front of it. This is not difficult stuff. You've probably been adapting to climate change for the last 40 years without even noticing it. I know my garden has it. It's slightly different, greener than it was. I mow the lawn more off. Well, I didn't need a big program of government intervention to notice that. Tom, I know, will be pleased to see this plug for his movie. Tom, made, uh, Tom produced this wonderful movie, Climate the Movie, with Martin Durkin. If you haven't seen it already, watch it on youtube or rumble or wherever it is i think tom was saying there's somewhere on the internet there are more than 100 copies of this now so it'd be very difficult for it to get suppressed it's a great movie and it talks a lot more about the behind the scenes politics of climate science and 
I suspect to nobody's great surprise, my final thought is that net zero really is for dummies. And I hope I've been able to show you some of the reasons why I think that during this hour long presentation. So thank you for your time. And uh, if you need to contact me, you want to put comments on the YouTube, I do try to respond to all the ones that aren't just you're a lying bastard or whatever it might be, or you can talk to me a little bit on Twitter. Thanks for your time. I'm just curious as you go about your daily life there in the UK, uh, do people know what net zero is, do you think? Strange enough, on the way here, the way to tonight, I took the dog for a walk to the cricket club and there were only two other people in the club and they said, what are you doing tonight? And I said, doing a podcast with Tom Nelson. Go, oh, he's the guy who made Climb at the Movie, isn't he? One of them did. So I thought that was, but I'd shown him that. Anyway, do people know? No, they, they hear about it. It's on the news quite a lot. Our BBC is uh, very much a net zero propagandist. So almost anything you watch, there will be climate change. There'll be David Attenborough weeping over something and uh, Chris Packham there and things. And, you know, net zero is essential. So they know something about it. What they don't understand is what it is. It, say that again. They've heard of it, but they don't understand it. And this kind of podcast is there to help. Okay. And do you think there's any enthusiasm by the ordinary voter that we have to live in a 15 minute city and eat the bugs and not fly all that type of stuff because they think they really need to absorb pain in order to, to prevent bad weather? No, there is no enthusiasm among people. There is, in, there is great enthusiasm among activists that somebody else should absorb the pain, but that's a different thing. 15 minute cities is interesting. Oxford, the, the university city just further up the, the Valley of the Thames. Um, they have a manic green type council and they are trying to introduce 15 minute cities by traffic controls and things like that. I'm not sure how well that's going. Oxford is notoriously residentially, it will be a green place because there's a lot of students. It's a you know, youngish university town and many of the people there are university. You know, if they're not students, then they work at the university and they're almost required to, to if they ever bring it in, I don't know how long it'll last. They've been doing in London something they call low traffic zones. And low traffic zones basically says you cannot drive down this street between the hours of this or you cannot drive down this street, whatever, because it's saving you from having traffic. And that's great because we don't want traffic. But of course, people do actually live in these roads and they would like to be able to drive them. And those are slowly, many of those are slowly being withdrawn. Now, they're introduced with great fanfare. The council says, we'll have a cycle path. I'm all for cycle paths, as you know. We'll have a cycle path and we'll have a roadblock and so forth. And we spent a million pounds on it. Isn't it great? And then three months later, you look for, well, where's this? Oh, well, the council demolished it yesterday quietly because they discovered that all they'd done was they moved the traffic congestion so that the ambulances can't get into the hospital anymore or whatever it might have been. So these things are being done, but they're not being done with great popular support. And I, don't, I think, as I hope I pointed out in the video, as people start to see the bills coming home, then they will wake up. And as that particular political party, Reform Party, is starting to say we'll have a debate and a referendum on it, that will also open more people's minds to it. Personally, oh, the last referendum I thoroughly enjoyed, so if we have one on this one, I'm going to really have a ball and we're going to win it. But uh, we, we did it last time. We had a ball at that as well. Okay. Uh, any other points you want to make before we finish this one up? I think that's it, Tom. To me, thank you for your time and thanks for asking me again. All right. Thanks a ton for doing this. I always appreciate hearing from you. Latimer Alder, talk to you next time. Bye. Cheers. Thanks.